welcome to the Cinnabar. Now we just got back from the Colorado Gun Collectors Association show out in Greeley, Colorado. And what a great show that was. We sold a lot of old guns there. My wife, the Colt Collector, she came home with three really interesting Colt rifles. Maybe our next episode will take a look at those. But alas, I didn't come home with a single Winchester for my collection. But don't feel too bad for me because I came home with the very best item at the show. And my new toy came with its own trailer. <laughs> Let's go get it unloaded and take a look at it. Okay, so it's time to unwrap this new toy. Hey, you might notice Arkansas plates on this trailer. Yep, this thing came all the way from Arkansas to Colorado. And now it's made itself two-thirds of the way across the country to its final rest resting place here in Oregon. And probably you can't see in there from the sunlight into the, that dark trailer, but let's take a little closer look. So what you're looking at here is a first generation Pratt & Whitney rifling machine designed clear back in the 1860s. This is a Civil War era design rifling machine that was in the Stevens factory. Just a, a fascinating piece of history. Let's, let's get it unstrapped and roll it out there into the shop and take a little closer look. Of course this machine has some modern conveniences that it wouldn't have had in the 19th century. Not the least of which is this electronic pallet jack. This was used for mostly for demonstrations at, at different shows and events so they put this electric pallet jack on it so they could load and unload it very easily and of course it works very nicely. Of course, we'll probably find a place here in the shop to set it up more permanently and, and probably just remove this. Now here's this Pratt & Whitney rifling machine in all its glory, sitting here, rifling the barrel. Now it's hard not to notice the contrast between 1860s Civil War era um, machining technology and behind us we've got CNC controlled modern milling machine. But the irony is that this rifling machine produces an absolutely spectacular board. Uh, a, a board that looks so good when, when it comes off the machine, uh, it looks like it's already been lapped or polished. It just is, is fantastic. And of course, a lot of the quality of rifling is dependent upon the, the rifling cutter itself, the, the tool holder, uh, the quality of the barrel stock, and, and the board that, that's originally in the, that uh, barrel blank. But of course, this rifling machine is, is doing the work of, of pushing and pulling and, and cutting, putting that, that twist in, which is, is dependent upon the sign bar down below, and of course, indexing it properly. In this case, we've got a, a six groove indexing here. Um, and, and so, the combination of those things, running at a, at a, at a slow speed and taking very, very small cuts, it's just producing a spectac spectacular board in these, in these barrels. So let's take a little closer look at, at the different components of this and, and how it all works. This machine's just kind of mesmerizing to watch. Drew quite the crowds over at the show and I'm, I'm told wherever he's had it uh, on display that it, it drew big crowds. Now, it's powered by an old three-phase electric motor these days, run with a belt and of course we're, we're gonna have to go old school and make some leather belts for it. If you notice a kind of a nice touch, a Colt's Patent Firearms fuse box there uses the old uh, glass bus fuses and we got plenty of those around the, the ranch here. 
Uh, the, the, one of the nice modern conveniences about this one is in order to, to set this one up for single phase power to that three phase motor, it has a variable frequency drive. So we can speed up or slow down this machine as we'd like. Now originally, you see that, that center pulley there, this would have been powered from a, an overhead um, line shaft and, and most likely in the early days when it first showed up at the plant, um, probably powered by water, then most likely later on that line shaft would have been powered by steam and then maybe towards the end of its production life, uh, maybe even an electric motor powered that line shaft. Now if we look at this swing arm, this is what gives it the uh, nickname, the, the grasshopper rifling machine. When you see that come up, it looks kind of like the hind leg of a grasshopper right there. Okay. And now it's, it's, it's geared with some, some really interesting gearing here, kind of a oblong elliptical like gears there. And of course we're going to keep those good and oiled up because I don't think I would want to try to replicate one of those, those gears. That'd be a hard one to make. And of course, now we're down to the heart of the machine, that sign bar, which the rack and pinion is riding on here, and the angle of that side sign bar dictates the rifling twist in the bore. So you can see it's adjustable down on this end here. Now this one's only adjustable out to uh, one in 25. So we're gonna have to make some adjustments to be able to rifle some of the larger bores with a slower twist rate. And that, that's gonna entail, um, we'll have a, a second place here to, to uh, mount this end of the sign bar so that we can raise that up a little bit and, and flatten out that that curve. Now if we want to do gain twist, it actually has a gain twist sign bar here. So, you know, like your early Colt percussion revolvers with gain twist, I think some of the early muzzle loaders had gain twist. We'd have to, we'd have to look and see just exactly the uh, profile of that gain twist and, and make a sign bar for it if this one didn't match. And it doesn't look to me like it really would match. It's not really progressive out at the end like you would expect. Of course here we see the, this rack and pinion that's just turning the cutter as it goes in, producing that twist rate. Again, uh, this one's set up at about 1 and 12 for this 30 caliber barrel that we're, um, that we're rifling here today. This is a, a, about a 21 inch barrel which would be uh, appropriate for most of your saddle ring carbines. Um, and we can see the, the uh, ratchet system here at work. Again, this one's a, 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 a six groove barrel, so we've got it's ratcheted in around six times. If we wanted to make a um, 66 or an early 73 barrel with, with five grooves, of course, we would have to fabricate a, a new ratchet system to go in for that, and may, maybe we'll do that someday. Um, just depends on if, if I have a need for it. Okay, down here on the end is, is a really kind of an ingenious little ratchet system that advances the cutter, so it deepens it. So in the, back in the day when they were running this thing automatically, this is what advances that, that cutter just a, a slight amount, about a tenth of a thousandth or a ten thousandth each time it advances. And what would happen is, is on, on the early cutters, this is a little different cutter that we've got working right now, um, there would just be a wedge that sticks out the end, and we'll take a look at a couple of those here in a minute, that goes underneath the cutter. So that, that wedge sticks out the end of that tool holder, and then it would bump up against this stop right here, which is advancing. It's on a very, very fine thread here. And that would push that wedge in a little bit and advance that cutter just a little bit. Now this is a, a modern one from Pacific Tool and Gauge over in White City. And we would just occasionally, as it comes through, if we're going faster, we'd maybe stop it. But like this, we just turn it a little bit and, and advance it. And then we keep measuring the board and stop when we get finished. Really kind of a, 
an amazing old machine. The history behind it, you know, it started out life on the East Coast rifle and barrels that a whole lot of them ended up out here in the Old West. And over the past 160 years, it's found its home right here in the middle of the Old West where a lot of the, a lot of the barrels that were rifled on this machine ended up. When we want to disengage the machine, we just have a, a handle right here, and we want to make sure the cutter's outside the cut, and we just sh shut it off like that. So now that, that cutter's out here, we can clean it out or whatever we want to do, and then we go to fire it back up. Fascinating machine. Now the other modern amenity that's been added to this machine is a modern oil pump here. And this recirculates the cutting oil from a reservoir in the bottom back up through the carriage here and, and through the hollow shaft and out into the, the cutter itself. Now it originally likely would have had a, a large reservoir gravity fed that rode along on the carriage here and provided that cutting oil. But this is a, a much better uh, situation here where we can, we can control and, and give a, a much more positive and consistent uh, pressure and volume of cutting oil to the cutter head. Now here's a variety of original scrape cutters that came with the machine. And we've got them from calibers down around 25 caliber all the way up to 45 and 50 caliber. Now the modern cutters are, are faced straight across in this direction and only cut in one direction. So when, when they come through, make the cut, they're spring loaded where they can be pushed back down and on the return side so we don't roll that edge over. Now the, the old original scrape cutters, which were used up until around World War II, were angled. You can see that the cutters are angled at, at about this angle, some of them even a, a steeper angle than that. And, and so these can return without doling the edge. So they actually are, are, are out and not spring loaded. They're, they're fixed out there um, and, and stay there in both directions. Now, here's one of these little wedges I was talking about that bump up against that stop that's, that's returning all the time. So here's, you can see it's just a little steel rod with a very slight taper coming out here and as it comes up against that that stop that's that's moving out just very slightly then it bumps up against it pushes that wedge in and pushes that that knife up the modern ones work very similarly except uh, I can say they're spring loaded for the return side and for these anyway we, we just manually adjust them now very few of these early Pratt & Whitney rifling machines survive today. Most of them were scrapped out many, many, many years ago. The fellow that I bought this from has done a lot of research on these machines and he believed that this particular machine was installed at the Stevens Firearms Plant in 1873 and remained there in operation up till 1959 when the plant was closed and auctioned off. At that time, it was purchased by George Newmerch of Newmerch Arms Company. Um, and then he sold it many years later to a collector and, and with ideas of he was going to get it running. And it went through two or three hands. And then to a fellow by the name of Doug Olson in Arkansas, who is a retired uh, firearms designer. And he's the one that, that put this thing all together and got it operating. Did, did a wonderful job with it. Um, you know. You might be asking yourself, well, why did somebody who's, who's restoring firearms buy such an ancient rifling machine? And that's a good question. Of course, if you watch our, our channel, you know how, how much we enjoy history and, and, and whatnot. But um, this is a machine that really is a good fit for us because it, it's not a, a high dollar, high production type machine. Uh, we in, enjoy the history of it. We'll be making some some barrels 
for our own purposes. We've, we've got a need to, to make barrels from time to time. We're certainly not going to use a machine like this for some kind of high production, uh, reproduction barrel making operation. That's just not in the cards. This will be for very limited production uh, specialty barrels. We're a long ways from making barrels. This is just one, one part of the process and we've still got a long ways to go to get it perfected for, for our needs and be able to make the kind of barrels with the kind of twist rates and diameters and dimensions that we need. Um, but we may at some point in the future uh, sell a few to, to fellow gunsmiths or that type of thing, well, probably not to the general public. Of course, rifling a barrel is just one critical step in producing a correct reproduction barrel. We're going to have to get set up with the tooling and equipment to be able to deep hole drill our, our barrel stock in all the different calibers that we're going to require. Uh, we're going to have to get set up to be able to profile both round and octagon barrels clear up to maybe even 36 inch. Um, we'll have to be able to thread and chamber barrels with all the different calibers that, that we're going to want. Um, and then we're going to have to be able to get the correct stamping and stamp these barrels both as far as the correct style and the correct placement of the stamp. So really it's going to be a fascinating journey. Well thanks for joining us today. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. We've still got a long road to go before we start making custom finished barrels. But we'll check back from time to time as we progress along that journey and, and invite you folks along to join us. Until next time, happy trails from the Cinnabar.